like it's a, a rainy, windy-ish night, so it's perfect weather for death. Hurrah. <laughs> I wanna thank you all so much for being here today. My name's Eliza Canty-Jones, and I serve here at the Oregon Historical Society as editor of our journal, the Oregon Historical Quarterly, and as our public outreach manager. And many of you have been with us all day, but a few of you have just arrived, so I'll tell you this is the capstone program for our day-long symposium, most of which uh, has focused on the subject of death and the settling and unsettling of Oregon. Uh, we've had a full day of outstanding presentations from truly knowledgeable speakers who have given us a lot to consider. And it's just wonderful to have Lauren Kessler here to cap off our day. Before I say a few words of introduction, I want to offer some thanks today. Uh, several people have made today's program possible. Uh, our sponsors include the Heathman Hotel and the Riverview Cemetery, and there are folks here from the Riverview Cemetery to answer questions, and there's some information, but I really appreciate their support. Thank you. Uh, I have a uh, wonderful, my, uh, someone overheard me saying a few minutes ago that I have fantastically competent colleagues at the Historical Society, and she said, oh, I wish we said that at my workplace. Uh, but it's really true, and I do want to thank uh, Rachel Randalls, who's here this evening and is our marketing manager, and our administrative coordinator, Ali Scott. The two of them have done great work to help pull off today's program, and I really appreciate it. Uh, un yay, yay, colleagues. <laughs> I want to recognize support from OHS's executive director, Carrie Timchuk, who's unable to be with us this evening, but has just been an enthusiastic supporter of this program since he first heard about it, and I really appreciate that. And several of my colleagues here at OHS are in the audience now and have been in the audience all day. And um, whether they've been here all day or now or have just said kind things about the program, their confidence, is, uh, confidence in this work has really meant a lot to me. And I appreciate all the time they've taken away from their desks to join us. So thank you, colleagues. The idea to focus on the subject of death in Oregon history broadly came from the Oregon Historical Quarterly's editorial advisory board. And we hope that today's program will lead to a special issue of the journal. Uh, in case there are a few of you who don't know, the Quarterly is a scholarly, peer-reviewed journal that is edited and produced for a broad audience. It has been co published continuously by the Oregon Historical Society since 1900, and it has always been a benefit of membership with the Oregon Historical Society. Um, the, the OHQ is uh, it's an outstanding publication and has been for a long time, and I want to recognize that because it is that way because of the support and the feedback and the work of the journal's editorial advisory board, who really serve as the constants who push the journal forward. And there are several advisory board members in the audience tonight, and I just want to thank you all again for your work with the journal. Uh, Dr. Matthew Dennis of the University of Oregon was a fantastic partner in developing and organizing this symposium, and he wrapped up presentations from throughout the day with an outstanding talk this afternoon, so I want to offer my thanks to him again, and also to all of the presenters who took their time to think and research and write and present really wonderfully provocative and informative presentations today. When we think about death in Oregon history, whether you're here in Oregon or elsewhere in the United States, it's likely that the subject of our state's path-breaking death with dignity law comes to mind. But to be honest, there's been very little scholarship about that law, so it's a particular treat to have Lauren Kessler here with us tonight to help us understand more about death with dignity in Oregon. Lauren Kessler is an award-winning author, and she describes herself as a sort of fearless immersion reporter. She combines lively narrative with deep research to explore a wide range of topics, including everything from the anti-aging movement to the particular relationship between mothers and daughters. She is the author of seven books of nonfiction, three of which are available for sale tonight, and I'd encourage you to make sure to stop by that table before you leave this evening. Her most recent book is uh, relevant, I think, to our discussion today. It's entitled Counterclockwise, my Year of Hypnosis, Hormones, Dark Chocolate, and Other Adventures in the World of Anti-Aging. Among other books she's published are the Pacific Northwest Book Award winning book, Dancing with Rose, 
which was published in paperback under the title Finding Life in the Land of Alzheimer's, and also Oregon Book Award winner Stubborn Twig, which was chosen as the book for all Oregon to read in honor of our state sesquicentennial in 2009. She has appeared twice on David Letterman's Late Night Show, and I bet you can ask her about whether that was fun. And her journalism has appeared in the range of a whole host of journals and publications, including the New York Times Magazine, the Los Angeles Times Magazine, O Magazine, Utney Reader, The Nation, and elsewhere. She's the director of the graduate program in multimedia narrative journalism at the University of Oregon. And we could not be pleased to have, more pleased to have her here with us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Lauren Kessler. Thank you so much, Eliza. That was a lovely introduction. And thank you, Eliza and Matt, for um, inviting me. I feel always w in the company of historians. Um, well, <laughs> let me just say that when I was in uh, journalism school, it was meant to be a compliment to say that journalism is history in a hurry. <laughs> And actually, history in a hurry is, I would think, bad history. Um, and so when I'm in the company of historians, I'm, I'm very aware that my profession has been called history in a hurry. Um, I, I want to second what uh, Eliza said about um, the symposium, uh, which I got a chance to sit in in the afternoon. Um, the opposite of history in a hurry is well crafted, well-researched, deeply thought history. And that's um, what we were treated to, I think, uh, today. So I'm, I'm really honored to be part of this. Um, but I, I do have some questions about this audience, because you could, so it's dark and stormy night, but you're here. And also, the bars are brimming with people because there's this game, I understand, that has something to do with the University of Oregon and some other team that is important to some people, but apparently not anybody in this room, including me. And then there's some kind of soccer thing going on. So thank you for not being sports nuts and instead for being fans of death or whatever else you're here, I don't know. Um, Matt said that it, that it was hard to be funny about death, and, and it is, and that was it. So thank you for the few little laughs, and now there's not going to be any other laughs. Um, so let me start this way. Stories are how we learn and how we understand. Stories are how we learn about the world, how we understand others, and how we understand ourselves. We tell stories, and we listen to stories. Stories are what make us human. They bring the incomprehensible closer, and they make us, they help us to feel so that we can think. And so tonight I actually want to tell you some stories. I want to tell you stories about an otherwise big and fearsome and fearful subject, a subject that's both definitive and mysterious universal and excruciatingly idiosyncratic, a subject that is often either so intensely personal that we can't see past our own involvement, or so steeped in detached debate and depersonalized legalisms that it doesn't resonate for us. And so I think we need to hear stories if we're to begin to understand what it means to legislate death in this state to create, enact, reject, enact, reject, reenact a law that gives us, us in this room, the legal right to execute people, and to create and pass a law and reinforce that law that allows some people to decide when they want to die. Oregon's approach to end of life issues seems both regressive and progressive. But that's political talk, and I want to talk story. So I want to tell you the stories of three men, all of whom faced death, and 
allow me to give away the ending. They all died. Um, because that's, you know, kind of what happens to all of us. Um, they all died under very different circumstances. And I hope in telling these stories that, it, that what they will help you feel and think and question and talk about legislated end of life in meaningful ways. So first, let me introduce you to a man named Tom McDonald. Tom um, was an active, jovial retiree who lived in a comfortable ranch house overlooking Lake Oroville, which is about an hour and a half north of Sacramento in California. When I met him, he was 75, and he was a good-looking guy, luxuriant head of silver hair, a handsome, fleshy face that was ruddy in kind of an outdoorsy way, and he had a good life. He and his wife, Dolores, doted on each other, clearly. They traveled the West Coast in an RV. They took weekend jaunts to Tahoe. They lounged with friends and family on a party barge that they had on Lake Oroville. Tom went trout fishing. He puttered around the house and invented gadgets. Two years before I had met him, he felt uh, a pin head sized lump or bump behind his uh, right knee. And the dermatologist who looked at it said he was probably nothing, but he would do a, a biopsy to make sure. When the results came back positive for melanoma, Tom took the news calmly. He had had a um, cancerous growth removed from his lip a couple of years before that. It was no big deal. He figured they'd just take it off and everything would be fine. Um, so the surgery went well, and doctors thought they got it all, but a CAT scan a year later showed that the melanoma had penetrated deeply into the tissue. There was another CAT scan, another surgery, another CAT scan, a PET scan, and then this news. Um, the cancer had spread to his lungs and to lymph nodes under his jaw. Chemotherapy doesn't work very well, or hardly at all in these cases, his doctor told him. And radiation is not much better. They gave Tom a year to live. Well, it took him only a few days to think through the situation. He was a take charge guy. He'd had a 30-year career as an electronics technician, much of it in the aerospace industry. And that had taught him to look at problems dispassionately and find the elegant solution. Simple, workable, quickly implemented, and then just go for it. So his terminal disease was the problem, and his solution was simple. When the time came, he told his wife and his son and his daughter, when he felt he could no longer tolerate whatever end-stage illness, the end-stage illness was doing to him, he would take matters into his own hands, and he would end his own life. But it turned out it wasn't that easy if such a thing could ever be called easy, because Tom lived in California. If he wanted or needed medical help or advice to end his life, he couldn't legally get it. And by medical help, I don't mean a Dr. Kevorkian figure coming into the room and injecting him with something lethal. Um, I mean a doctor who could talk to him, advise him, perhaps advise him on medication that would peacefully end his life, advise him on dosage, write him a prescription. In California, uh, it's a crime to do that. Let's leave Tom for a moment and let me introduce you to David Bradley. So like Tom, David was also diagnosed with uh, uh, an illness that gave him a very short amount of time to live. He had uh, esophageal cancer, and it's a tough one to beat. He'd noticed a few months before he finally went into the doctor that he was having trouble swallowing, but Tom was not one of those guys who went to the doctor, so he let it go for a while. He was 80, and although he was Midwestern born, he'd become in his later years a kind of 
part desert rat, part born again cowboy. He lived alone in the high desert in New Mexico, um, up the road from a town where Billy the Kid had been a kid. He spent his days quietly, he rode his horse, he had coffee every morning at a cowboy diner, he painted, he socialized, he took photographs. He'd always been healthy. He still worked out at a gym several times a week and you could see it from his biceps. He was a free spirit, a nature lover, a man who carried an eagle feather talisman, a man who'd been married and parted company amicably amicably, I should say, with four wives, which is a tough thing to do. So David Bradley had a peaceful life, a faithful dog, and a prognosis of six months to live. For him and for Tom McDonald, the reaction to the, for him as for Tom McDonald, the reaction to this news was swift and decisive. When he learned that there was no effective treatment, when he understood what the end game would mean, he told his family, I'm just gonna take care of it myself. And they knew exactly what he meant. But David had something that Tom didn't have. He had a big family who lived in Oregon and had lived in Oregon for a while. If David moved to Oregon to stay with one of his daughters, he would have, if he cared to exercise it, a choice about how and when he died. Because in Oregon, as it is now in the state of Washington and in Vermont, but Oregon was the first, a competent, communicative, fatally ill person with documented di prognosis of six months or less to live can legally obtain a prescription from a doctor for a lethal dose of barbiturates. The terminally ill person has to be capable of taking the medication him or herself. That's that's Oregon's death with dignity legislation. That's it. It's simple and straightforward, but the public battle to create the legislation and to keep it in place has been anything but. Oregonians, just to give you, to leave our two men for a moment, Oregonians passed the death with dignity law in 1994. It came to voters as a citizen initiative. So we, we actually were the first to pass a death with dignity law, and we were also, I believe, although I hate to say this, in a place that has a whole bunch of historians, because I might not, I might be wrong here, but if Oregon was not the first um, in the progressive era of the early 20th century to um, create the citizen initiative, it was one of the first states to do the citizen initiative, so I think that's kind of a a double first for us. Um, so it, it uh, uh, came to the voters as citizen initiative. It passed in 1994, and it was immediately challenged by uh, the National Right to Life Committee. That's the anti-abortion uh, lobbying group. A US district judge ruled in favor of the Right to Life group, and, in, and there was an injunction against the Oregon law that kept it in limbo until the Ninth Circuit of Appeals, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals overturned the ruling a year later. Um, and then Right to Life group, to, and so that was an overturn, the law was back, but Right to Life then sought a review from the Supreme Court. Uh, meanwhile, lobbying the Oregon legislature to call for a special election to repeal the, the act. So the Supreme Court refused to hear the case, and the special election, which was held in 1997, um, overwhelmingly re-endorsed the right to life, um, I mean the uh, death with dignity uh, legislation. So it looked like the battle was over, but it wasn't. Four years later, there were new challenges from then U.S. Attorney General John Ashcroft, you might remember him, and his successor, uh, Alberto Gonzalez. It took a lawsuit by the state of Oregon a U.S. District Court case, two appeals to the Ninth Circuit, and finally, decisively, the Supreme Court ruling in January of 2006 to uphold Oregon's Death with Dignity Act. So that's uh, now the underpinning for our two stories. So let's get back to David. David moves to Oregon. 
He's self-reliant, an independent thinker his whole life. And he wanted an equally independent, self-reliant exit from that life. Just a few weeks after getting his prognosis, he came to Oregon, to Portland, to live with one of his daughters and begin to plan carefully with his family, with his children, and with his grandchildren, a peaceful death. He was installed in an upstairs bedroom in his daughter's home that was almost immediately filled with his own books and memorabilia, and he spent his days quietly coming to terms with what he had and had not been able to accomplish in his life, contacting old friends, strengthening his relationship and connection with his grandchildren. His family, uh, with the help of a group called Compassionate Choices of Oregon, uh, started the necessary paperwork to, for death with dignity, uh, made the doctor's appointments, found a doctor, and David, with his health failing quickly, was able to then take advantage of the last months and then weeks and then days of his life. The family planned an outdoor ritual which David was healthy enough to go to or strong enough to go to. But it was in the upstairs bedroom under a Pendleton blanket with his dog curled up by him and his daughter's and grandchildren downstairs that David swallowed a lethal dose of Nembutal and died peacefully. It was a good death, a good death that the state of Oregon, the people of Oregon, us, granted him, allowed him. Meanwhile, in California, let's rejoin Tom McDonald. So Tom, with his prognosis now, not good, is trying to process all of the things that, that one needs to process at the end of one's life and can't do it because he is in, instead thinking about and obsessing over how he's going to take control of his own exit. He thinks seriously about just shooting himself in the head. He has a gun, he knows guns. It would be easy for him to do that. And he almost convinces himself that that's what's gonna happen. Until he thinks it through and realizes that that's not what he wants to leave for his wife and his children. He belongs to a big HMO in, in California and he goes to doctors who all refuse to talk to him about end of life issues because they can't. He does a lot of uh, internet searching. He finds Compassionate Choices of Oregon. He finds um, Hemlock Society. He finds a bunch of websites. He reads. This is a man who's dying and, and should be doing something other than figuring this stuff out. Um, and he comes up with a plan. It's not his plan. It's a plan that, is, that people have when they don't live in a state like Oregon, Washington, or Vermont which is uh, to go shopping the docks, D-O-C-S, not D-O-C-K-S. Um, that is making a bunch of um, appointments that are a specific number of weeks apart and getting uh, prescriptions for barbiturates, which are only given in very small quantities and not taking them even though he's in pain and actually needs to take them, and, not, and saving all of his pain pills, and saving everything that he has, hoarding it. Um, and, and hoping that what he's reading on the internet in terms of doses, and in terms of what the correct medications would be, and what happens if he has different medications, could he take them all together, um, and hoping that's all right. It involves multiple appointments, each with a different doctor, spread across several months. It involves lying, which does not come easy to this man. And his last months are spent in turmoil. And time runs out. Tom McDonald dies as he so much wanted not to die, in a hospital, medicated for pain, 
and medicated and in pain so much that he was so medicated that he was non-communicative. The decision about when and where and how to end a life was legislated away from him. It's difficult for me, I think it's difficult, <laughs> not to see Oregon, the Oregon legislation as compassionate, as reflective of a humane, caring, and concerned attitude toward life and death, as a family-centered attitude toward life and death. Well, okay, and then there's like the flip side of this state that we find ourselves the citizens of. The death penalty in Oregon. Another legislated end of life. Well, it's difficult to tell a sympathetic story about a person who's guilty of crimes terrible enough to put them on death row. So that's not my purpose here in telling you this next, the third story. I'm not trying to create a sympathetic portrait. This is not a man who um, was found later to be innocent and, um, and because of DNA evidence or something. This was a guilty guy who did some bad stuff. This was not a guy you're gonna like. I don't know if you're gonna not like him enough to want to be complicit in executing him. So I'm not trying to be creating any sympathy for him. I am trying to give a human face to that other way that we legislate uh, end of life in this state. We have given ourselves and, uh, and, re and um, gone back and reenacted our power to kill. Um, in the state, in our name, citizens of Oregon, we've actually executed 124 people in the state of Oregon um, since we started executing people. Uh, we haven't executed anybody since 1978. We've had a, I think, justifiably conflicted relationship with capital punishment in this state. The Oregon Constitution originally had no provision for death penalty. The statute was enacted in 1864, uh, allowing for death penalty in the states of, in, the, in uh, first degree murder. And Oregon voters amended the Constitution in 1914 to repeal the death penalty by a margin of just a tiny little hair over 50%, 50.04%. 50 the repeal was an initiative of Governor uh, Oswald West personally my favorite governor. Um, I have a, because he was also the governor that signed uh, the um, state law enfranchising women. And I have a picture in my office of Abigail Scott Dunaway and uh, Oswald West signing the, I mean, it's not an original picture, but I, I think I actually photocopied it from Oregon Historical Society Journal. <laughs> anyway, this, so Oswald West was behind that repeal in 1914. The death penalty was restored, again by constitutional amendment in 1920. Voters outlawed the death penalty in the general election of 1964, with 60% of the vote. Voters reenacted the death penalty in the general election of 1978 but then that statute was overturned by the Oregon Supreme Court in 81. In 84, the Constitution was uh, amended once more to make death penalty legal. And then as you probably know, um, last year, the year before last, time goes quickly, 2011, uh, John, uh, John Kitzhaver announced a moratorium on executions in Oregon um, and ordered a review of the death penalty in the state. The last execution in the state of Oregon, as I said, was 1978, and um, that's the, a little bit of the story I want to tell you. But first, a tiny bit more context. 
Um, capital punishment in our country is enacted state by state, as is death with dignity, actually. Um, Washington, D.C. and 18 states, including, in case you're interested, all of New England and all of the upper Midwest have abolished the death penalty. Several of them never had the death penalty, and several of them abolished it back in the 1800s. So Oregon is one of 34 states with a death penalty. Um, since the mid-1970s, uh, 1,264 people have been executed in the United States. Um, and a third of them were executed in one state, and I bet you know what state that is. Texas, yes. The United States ranks fifth in the world for executions. You will perhaps be happy to know that the company that we keep in the top five are Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, and China. Other countries that share our death penalty morals include Syria, Somalia, North Korea, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Egypt. 140 countries have abolished or, or have not practiced uh, capital punishment, or do not practice capital punishment. So here we are, one of 34 states, and we've got in the 1970s, a bunch of people still on death row, or on death row, and now we're going to hear the story of Henry Charles Moore. He was executed um, May, um, in, in he, okay, he was executed for the murder of um, a man named Thomas Laurie and a woman named Barbara Cunningham. So Moore, the, the criminal here, the murderer, shot uh, Thomas Laurie four times in the face with a nine millimeter handgun in front of the uh, main post office in Salem. And then he drove to Cunningham's house and shot her in the stomach and then when she was down, he put three rounds into her head to make sure that she'd stay down. The woman was Moore's half sister and the guy that he killed was the half-sister's former husband. You have to keep this all straight because it gets weirder. Uh, Moore said that he killed his relatives because he thought that they would move to Las Vegas with his estranged wife and infant daughter and expose them to a life of prostitution and drugs. He made a number, the, the murderer here, made a number of public utterances about sin the sins of Las Vegas, and when he was incarcerated in, at uh, Oregon State Penitentiary, the evil scum, as he called them, uh, of, uh, that were his fellow inmates, who he uh, told a journalist, those are the foulest, most evil sickos I've ever been around, to which one wants to say, takes one to no one. I need to mention that his estranged wife, the one that he didn't want to go to Las Vegas to leave with his infant daughter, was also his niece. He'd actually married two. Two of his three wives were his nieces. And the half-sister that he shot was also his mother-in-law. Are you keeping... I, yeah, I, I had to like write a chart for this. The uh, deputy state public defender who acted as his lawyer many years later wrote that this guy was, quote, vulgar, profane, brutal, vindictive, rigid, and an incestuous pedophile. He waived all appeals and demanded to be executed. He said he was looking forward to it. He requested that his executioner be a woman and that the execution be televised and it be scheduled at the moment of his birth. Well, he got one thing that he wanted, he was executed. 
now might be the time to mention that the person who was tasked with injecting Mr. Moore with lethal drugs had considerable trouble finding a suitable vein. So he was strapped to the gurney for half an hour uh, while various people tried to find a good vein. And we felt morally entitled to do this. So, is ending life a criminal's life, an enemy soldier's life, your own life? Is it a legal issue? Is it a political issue? A philosophical issue? Is it about religion, morality? To what extent is it personal? To what extent is it public? I'm not sure we know how to think about legislated end of life, let alone what to think about it. And I'm really not sure that as Oregonians, we've done the very difficult work of thinking some of these things through, of looking at these two state statutes and pondering their coexistence, of letting our conflicted and confused feelings open rather than close the door to informed conversation. This is tough stuff because death is private. It's an intensely personal experience, yet it's also ritualized and public. Funerals and processions, viewings of bodies, large swaths of open land devoted to storing dead bodies, obituaries in newspapers, and back in the old days, public executions, and actually some places in the world, public executions, hangings, guillotines, guillotining, whatever the verb would be, and legislation. Death is the subject of an extraordinary, an extraordinary number of laws and ordinances, statutes, licensure, licensures, I can't say that, edicts. Death has been a central concern of the law. It involves documents and paperwork, certificates, directives. The state is involved, the state, not just the state of Oregon, the state is involved in almost every aspect of death, from when and how to declare death, to who handles a dead body, to where a dead body can reside, whether one has control over one's death, whether the government legally, morally, can take the life of a human being, and so I would argue that in our state, in Oregon, there is death with dignity. A thoughtful dying person makes a dignified decision, often within the context of a family, a loving family, to quietly and painlessly and as gracefully as is possible exit his or her life. And I would argue that there is death without dignity both for the person who's executed, strapped to a chair, strapped to a gurney, electrocuted, injected, gassed, whatever the current method is as we try and find a humane method. There's no dignity there. I would argue there's no dignity for us, for a civilized, evolved society that endorses that. So I, I want to leave you to ponder that, not to necessarily feel one way or another about these two forms of legislated end of life, but to see them as I don't even want to say opposite, but to to just think of how much the state is involved in making decisions like this, how much we want the state to be involved, and what does it mean that we have death with dignity and death without dignity next to each other in our state. 
And right. So that that is what I want to leave you with. That's what I'd like you to think about. And I and I want this to be. I feel very strongly that when there when when we are conflicted about something, when we feel passionate about something, it often makes us close the door or close our mind to something. And I think I think we absolutely need to open our mind to this, as as the state revisits the death penalty. And um, as I think that we can assume that there will always be at least rhetoric around, if not um, concerted efforts to overturn the death with dignity. So let those two coincide in your mind the way they coincide in the state. And, and let's have some meaningful talk about it. I'm happy to answer questions, although Please make them easy so I can answer them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Lauren. I wanted to say we would be pleased to have people ask questions. We have a microphone. We have colleagues from Metro East who are recording. So if you ask a question, you get to be on cable access TV. So. Well, that'll either the cause, yeah, it'll cause people to do it or not do it. I know. <coughs> yeah. Thanks. With uh, increased uh, use of hospice and advanced forms of pain control and so forth, is is self-directed uh, death increasing, decreasing, or staying the same in Oregon? It's ne um, staying the same. I would say. Um, we've always been a very strong hospice state, and because of the work of some forward-looking eth ethicists at Oregon Health Sciences University, we have had a very strong um, health directive that, that, that the medical community actually pays attention to, unlike a lot of states. So um, not that many people exercise the, the use death with dignity. Um, many people apply, and when they're asked later, when they don't go through with it, they say, it was knowing that I could that gave me that peace. So there was, at, at the time that this was passed and then revoked and passed again, it was gonna be like everybody, everybody was gonna start using it. So it has not gone up or down. It has remained a very modest amount. And you're absolutely right, pain control is better. And, and hospice is a very important and humane way to treat end of life. Any other questions? I can see you all now. What do you think the reason is that so many of our states in our country have not enacted, I mean, besides the South and, and our obvious understanding of why they don't do it, what about, I mean, there's plenty of states, you know, in the East Coast, um, New England area where it seems as though there should be a tradition for self-determination in an area like this, um, an attitude of um, wanting to mind our own, you know, their, each person's own business and leaving people alone. Um, what do you think is the reason that other states have not enacted it? There's only three states in the country. Um, although I understand New Jersey is on the verge, so I guess we'll see what happens there. But And, and also Montana, um, because of a court decision, Apparently, it is um, some sort of form of death with dignity. So, I, you know, I wish, I wish that I knew. I, I have some theories about it. I think that the whole discussion about this um, ha came from a polluted pool, the, the Dr. Kevorkian pool. And I think it's very, and, 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 and even the language, in our state we say death with dignity, which is um, a step up from physician-assisted suicide, which is how it's often called, which is a step up from euthanasia. Um, and so in many parts of the country those steps have not been made. And the, the idea is um, 
There's, there's like the dark figure of Dr. Kevorky and Dr. Death. Um, there's also the notion that the medical community should, n should not in any way be involved in helping somebody die, um, since that's, they're not supposed to do any harm, and if you view helping somebody die as harm, which, it, which is that how it's been determined, then the medical community is not happy about that. Um, I think you could look at the fierce arguments, the anti-death with dignity arguments made in our state to see you know, um, why some other states might not enact it. Um, and so part of it comes from the medical community, and part of it is the same sort of thing about, you know, the, the Obama death commi um, committees or panels or something. There's that sort of thing. Like uh, insurance companies will try to get behind death with dignity because then they won't have to pay, you know, uh, uh, health insurance premiums at the end of life keeping somebody alive. So it will be in their best interest to have a bunch of people uh, off themselves. So it's, it just gets very, you know, it gets very complicated. But I agree with you, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, when, I, when I investigated uh, Oregon's death with dignity and I profiled these two men for a story, I did it for the Los Angeles Times, and I did it because California was voting on a death with dignity act, which they defeated. I'm not really sure if there's an answer to this question, but I'll pose it anyway. Uh, do you have any insight as to <clears throat> perhaps how um, right to life organizations can oppose right to death among people who are competent to make that choice and yet so often endorse capital punishment or even worse, foreign wars in which we have little interest? Um, because they're hypocrites? No, I, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, you know, the, the um, I think that one has to absolutely 100% respect people who believe in the sanctity of life from the creation of life until the exit across the board, which means they are pacifists, which means they are against abortion, which means they're against capital punishment, which means they are against war. And, and that is the sanctity of life. And it would be, it, it's um, a, a moral and religious stance that is, um, that is, that's respectful in a very important way. Uh, and, but to pick and choose, is it just is sort of morally bankrupt, I would say. So that's my answer. I had a question. I've worked in uh, death care, or whatever you want to call it, for 41 years. So I've observed uh, before death with dignity for many years and after. And I, uh, I applaud Oregon for you know, for passing this, but I'm surprised that so relatively few people uh, actually utilize it. Uh, do you have insights as to why that might be? Um, I, I actually do, and it's, um, and I don't want to make light of this decision at all, but let me liken it to this. Um, I have a prescription for Xanax that I keep in my purse when I fly. I have not taken one of those pills in probably five or six years. I used to be deathly afraid of, not to use the word death, I used to be very afraid of flying. Um, but it is knowing that I have those pills in my purse that makes me a happy flyer. And it is knowing that you could, at some point, if the pain was 
unremitting if whatever end of whatever uh, terminal stage you were in was something that was just not handleable. If the time felt right, you could do this. There is a peace of mind that people have, the way I have peace of mind with my prescription, that um, allows them, you know, a freedom. And 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 most people do not choose it. I think I, I I did all this research, and I'm not remembering the numbers, which I didn't look up. But it's it's a, maybe like 10 to 15 percent of people who go through the paperwork actually um, take a lethal. Uh, dose of Nembutal in the state. And part of that is just timing, because in our state, you have to be, uh, the, the law is written that you have to be physically able to take this drug. So it cannot be injected. You have to be able to drink it or you know, swallow it in some way. And some people wait too long so that it is not possible for them to um, administer the drug to themselves, for themselves, and a doctor cannot help, and, and, it's, and, you can't, and it can't be injected. So part of it is just is that timing, but I think a lot of it is just the peace of mind that you get knowing that you do have this control if you choose to um, you know, take it. <clears throat> you, uh, you noted non-malfeasance a couple minutes ago. Um, are physicians in Oregon compelled to act in accordance with someone's wishes to, to end their own life? Um, or do they have an option to, to, to not go along with that? And if th that's the case, does doctor shopping also occur here? And also, I'm just kind of curious about your thoughts on Kevorkian, because I know he's been demonized, and I don't think that's necessarily incorrect, but... If you, if you feel that way, what was it about his actions? Was it the the seeking of pub, pub, <clears throat> excuse me publicity or the the way that he went about it? Uh, you know, what makes him him different than a, another physician who would offer that sort of service to someone? Um, so the first question is um, that uh, no, a, do a doctor does not have to um, comply with. Uh, his or her patient's wishes to end life. Um, uh, the, there are, um, I don't know what the percentage is, but there are a number of doctors in the state of Oregon who are, um, who will do this. And in Oregon, the person has to have, as I think I said, a, six, a, a diagnosis of six months. They have to be, it can't be uh, dementia or Alzheimer's because and, and they can't be mentally ill. They have to um, not be depressed, which I think is actually quite funny. <laughs> you're going to die in six months, but if we say you're depressed, then you know you can't <laughs> take this drug. Um, so the doctor shopping, I, I think that I would, uh, I, I understand your point, and what I would say is that Compassionate Choices of Oregon and some other groups have lists of doctors um, in Portland or wherever you happen to live who um, are in support of Death with Dignity. And um, so it, it's a little bit nicer than shopping around. Um, and certainly you could ask your own physician and that person will say no, but I know somebody who will help you here. So there's, there is some of that, um, but doctors cannot be compelled to do it. I think Kevorkian, um, I mean, there's something about injecting somebody, <laughs> I think, you know, um, and, he, and he was called by the press Dr. Death, um, and he um, sought publicity, and it is, you know, as, it is a very, very private decision. It is a family, generally family-centered decision, and then to have this guy who actually sort of looked a little skeletal and death-like himself. He was a good media image for himself. Um, come in, I, you know, I think it was the wrong time and, and he was outspoken and he didn't know how to play to the masses. Um, I think there are all kinds of 
reasons. I mean, you, you could find many physicians um, who would have been more articulate and would have spoken in uh, kinder and gentler terms about uh, end-of-life issues than uh, Jack Kevorkian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hi, um, I'm a new Oregonian, um, and so I just wanted to observe that when I was thinking of coming to Oregon from my post in the Midwest, uh, I knew I was coming to a state that had death with dignity, but I had no idea until I arrived here that for the first time in my life, I am 71 years old, I was living in a state that had the death penalty. And so my question, I've heard you talk tonight about how we should consider this sort of odd juxtaposition, but what I'd like to hear a little more about that I'm having trouble understanding now that I've been here for a while, is what were the social forces that led in the same place to these two very different outcomes. Uh, I don't really understand how we got the death penalty and death with dignity in the same place. I, I think you, you join the vast majority of us for not understanding. Um, you know, uh, Colorado just had a vote about whether the eastern part of Colorado should become the 51st state, and, and, and there's this kind of two Colorados, and there, there are two Oregons as well. I mean, there really is the uh, frontier justice, um, gun rack in the back of the pickup, rough and tumble Oregon. And then there's the barista <laughs> Pearl District uh, Oregon. Um, and, and so, I mean, I, I, I think that, that, that um, I'm not sure that that's, I'm not sure that's the answer to this, but I do think that um, both the death penalty and death with dignity have been, th it's the, the, both of those histories are quite tumultuous and they both involve citizen initiatives, public votes, governor's uh, interventions. And so if you, if you look at them, they, they look you know, kind of similar. Um, and so it becomes even more mysterious that um, similar process leads to such different results. It may also be that people don't see it the way I see it, that there's death with dignity and death without dignity. I mean, there are certainly people who firmly believe that when somebody does, commits heinous crimes, we should get rid of that person. We should kill that person. And, and so, I mean, I, I don't know what to say about that. But I'm happy to hear what other people have to say about how these two, I think, quite contrary attitudes toward legislating death uh, coexist in the state. I feel like they, they coexist at the same time, possibly, because laws change so slowly. Um, so you have a, a notion of pushing autonomy forward for the individual with something like death with dignity, um, but you're also disassembling a, a, an existing law at the same time, and I think sometimes those things have crossover, and they don't move lockstep with one another. Um, and it just it takes time to separate those.
well, I don't want to get shot here, but I think that Dr. Kevorkian was a hero, and I'd say that because he started the dialogue. He started a serious dialogue in this country, and up until Dr. Kevorkian, we didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about dying. We didn't talk about the right of somebody to make a decision to end their life when their life was terminal. Um, that was all done behind closed doors, and and it's and it's very interesting to me being in the baby boom generation and watching some of the other issues um, that also have come out of the closet. Breast cancer. I mean, remember when Betty Ford and Happy Rockefeller announced that they had breast cancer? Oh my gosh, that was a big deal. And before them, it was talked about behind the hand. It was supposed to be kind of like not very nice because it had to do with your breasts. And now it's like no big deal. We talk about breast cancer. We run for it. We walk for it. We sleep for it. We do all these things. Uh, menopause is another topic. And I mean, these are women's topics, but death affects all of us. And now it's a topic that we're talking about. Um, when I was in law school in Utah back in the 90s, um, uh, the Compassion in Dying sponsored a, a, a day-long conference in Salt Lake City inviting doctors and lawyers and social workers and psychologists. And I was fortunate to be in a health law class and our professor was involved because she was a, a legal and medical eth eth ethics um, specialist. And so she invited her students to come. And they said in Utah back in 1997, people were dying in pain because the doctors were afraid to prescribe enough drugs to keep them out of pain because prescribing more pain-killing drugs hastens death. My mother died in 2012 in Utah of pancreatic cancer, and she was in a, a assisted living or whatever, a hospice care center for the last two months of her life and she was on a pain pump. And there was never a question. I mean, it was like, we will come in and push the button every two hours, but as long as she is able to push it herself, she's free to push it herself. Um, and then once she was in the last week of her life, when I was there and my brother was there, we were told by the hospice nurse, if you see her wrinkling her forehead, if it looks like she's in pain, feel free to push the button. There was never a suggestion that we were going to get in trouble if we gave her too much pain medication. So I think just in terms of 1997 to 2012 in that state, which is pretty conservative, we've come a long way. And it has to do with this discussion about death and our right to make our own decisions about it, which Dr. Kevorkian started. And so like him or don't like mm -hmm. him, don't like the way he looks, don't like the way he did it, but he didn't go out looking for people to kill. People chose to go to him because they wanted to have the right to make that decision themselves. And I think that 100 years from now, he's going to go down as a pioneer in, in self-determination and death. You know, I think he, he is a pioneer, and, and you started that, the whole thing that you said with um, somebody that you might get shot for saying this. I guarantee in this room nobody's going to shoot you. Um, but <laughs> just, you know, thinking about that. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I, I, he did open that discussion. And I think that anybody who does that, that you know, the nail that uh, gets up gets hammered or the nail that sticks up gets hammered. And so um, absolutely, yeah. I think that the hot, I think one of the things that has just absolutely revolutionized uh, end of life care is actually not uh, or end of life decisions is not death with dignity as much as it is hospice. And um, I think we can be really proud of hospice in the state of Oregon and hospice in our prisons, which is um, uh, something that I'm, uh, a story that I'm working on right now. Um, we were not the first state to do this, but people age very, very quickly in prison. And when we put somebody away for life, that means that they die in prison. Um, people are, they, they actually age about 15 years faster than the rest of us in prison for all the reasons that you might imagine, plus the fact that some of them come in ill um, or as addicts. Um, and we have amazing hospice, um, prisoner run hospice that not just changes the lives of the men and women dying, but 
absolutely changes the lives of the inmates who are witnesses and present there. It's just, it's an astonishing thing to learn about and to be, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I, back to, I don't want to uh, beat this a little too hard, but back to this uh, contrast between these two different measures. I think part of it, of what you're seeing, is the, the way the, the initiative process works. It's a political process that allows a small group of very well-organized and well-funded people to pass legislation that normally would be passed by a legislator. And that can work both ways. It's a double-edged sword, and it's been that way throughout the history of the initiative process. So now we have a constitutional amendment prohibiting same-sex marriage, for example. Uh, which may be overturned next year, I don't know, but um, it goes both ways, that's all I'm trying to say. Thanks. I just want to speak a little bit to the idea of self-determination um, with respect to talking about death and our freedom to talk about death. Um, I have a business uh, called the Natural Burial Company and have been really, uh, been working on it for about 10 years now and have been just exploring how our choices about what we do or what we want at the end of our lives seem to be proscribed uh, just by lots and lots of other people. And the sponsor of this uh, meeting tonight, Riverview Cemetery, they now offer, as of a couple of years ago, natural burial in any one of their plots. And <clears throat> David Noble, who spoke earlier, and myself have often just, I think, kind of wondered um, why we why our decisions about the end of our lives, something that's obviously completely personal to us and in many ways should be and used to be revered as our last wishes, why that, uh, what's shifting right now in our society do you think that's allowing us to be more, have more rights to self-determinism uh, with respect to death? What are you seeing? And in, in this whole giant topic here, because yeah. we're just talking about this, now I'm not talking about I'm facing terminal illness, I'm just saying this is my stuff and this is what I want to have happen to my stuff and there's a whole bunch of obstacles that are standing in the way of me even determining what happens to my stuff of my body. At yeah, the end of no, my I life. hear what you're saying. Uh, you know, to me it feels like just um, that that's how um, that's how a, a society or a people are prior to um, decades and centuries of laws and legislation. And so that we're now looking at this thick layer of legislation that is, interferes with our um, self-determination to love who we want to love and marry who we want to marry to end our lives when we want to end our lives, that all of a sudden these things that are very personal decisions that, that should be personal decisions, there's like this thick layer of legislation um, that is, uh, that's obstacles. So to me it feels like um, going back to a, a society that's not hidebound by laws that uh, interfere with the individual private lives of individual, uh, the, the private lives of people. Um, so I don't know that, it's, you know what I'm saying? I think it's cyclical. I think that, that uh, our culture, our society used to be more like that. And then we just, we have, you know, like tons and tons and tons of legislation and ordinances and statutes and laws and, and, um, and not every, you know, not every civilized society on earth has that. Um, even in very, in, and, uh, and you know, the stuff that we're talking about is fairly heavy duty stuff. But I was thinking about the last time I was in Europe and watching people take their dogs into places. And, and you know, that we have like the, all these laws about where you can, you know, health laws. And you don't want an animal to, you know, mess up anything, but I never actually saw anything objectionable happening with any animal that was allowed in any place. 
uh, yet we have all of these, something like that, you can't have your little dog companion with you to walk into a bakery to pick up your croissant here, but it's fine elsewhere. And it's sort of a trivial uh, example, but it, just to say that just because we live in the, uh, you know, in the 21st century and we are the kind of society that we are, that that's how everybody is. That, that everybody has made all of these kinds of laws that um, prescribe how we act and uh, what we can do in the privacy of our own homes. Not true. <laughs>